Hello and welcome to the Commonweal Policy Podcast. I'm Craig DL, the Head of Policy and Research at Commonweal. And this week I am joined by special guest Seamus McPhee, an independent researcher and a gypsy traveller living in Scotland who has recently written a paper, The Uglier Side of Bonnie Scotland, The Tinker Housing Experiment. This was a programme running from the 1940s to the 1980s involving housing gypsy travellers in inadequate conditions uh, and an attempt to quote unquote, integrate them into mainstream society. Um, Seamus, welcome on to the show. Um, how are you? I'm, I'm fine, thank you very much for that uh, fanfare, uh, Craig. Um, as you say, my name's Seamus McPhee, I'm an Akin. I would self-define as Akin or Gypsy Traveller if you wish to use the official designation adopted by the Scottish Parliament. I was born and raised in one of the experiments, but I must uh, just point out uh, from the outset that these continued beyond the 1980s. The one, you know, where I live in Pitlochry uh, was in place until 2009 and arguably still continues given the second-hand nature of the accommodation that we were you know, offered as an upgrade and which I refused. Because I, you know, I deemed that to be a continuation of substandard living conditions, and uh, so you know things are still ongoing. Uh, you know, and we don't know whether any of the other experiments still exist because they were widespread throughout Scotland, um, and you know, far flung locations as far north as Wick, Inverness, or Aberdeenshire, the borders. Um, you know, they were ubiquitous. Mm. So, can you tell us about about the the programme itself, as, as you said, started in the 1940s. Can you give us just a kind yeah, of potted yeah. history of it? Yeah, I'll try and, you know, fill in the pieces uh, for yeah, anyone who's interested. Um, I think that the experiments were rooted in uh, policies developed in the 1890s. And you need to look at the Scottish Traveller Report 1895 <clears throat> to sort of grasp... Um, you know, the underlying intentions um, of the state party who initiated the experiments at the end of the day. Um, a, a, a whole raft of recommendations were put forward and those included extirpation, you know, deportation of colonies, sending children to industrial schools, segregated schools, um, you know, putting unruly kids on Mars ships. So, that was then um, picked up on by the Departmental Committee on Tinkers, which um, presided over matters relating to World War I. And they then began to conduct head counts with a view to the people being placed in the experiments down the line. So, you know, there's this gradual planning uh, mechanism, if you like, um, and the cogs are churning away in the background uh, because, you know, genocides take, you know, assiduous planning, require assiduous planning. That's the point I would stress there. So this was developed over a number of years. And the culmination of, uh, you know, that mindset was the Tinker Housing experiments, which were put in place um, at the end of World War Two. And they were monitored over a 20-year period, in our case. Um, you know, the people who were placed in the experiments upon the uh, recommendation of the Church of Scotland were subject to fairly close supervision. So, you know, there's this whole insidious, um, whole insidious sort of policy going on in the background, you know, whereby uh, people are subject to scrutiny, replacing the experiments. They weren't told that they were going to be experimented upon without consent. It was dressed up uh, and, and couched very carefully in the language of care in the community that the accommodation was passed off as <clears throat> um, huts for ex-servicemen because so many families had uh, members who served in the forces, you know, during the wars and also beyond that in various conflicts and, you know. But um, I, I think there was this, yeah, there was this, um, how would you say, um, deception, really, 
element of deception there, whereby people were duped into, uh, you know, moving into the houses, and they were also coming under pressure from the education and the police authorities um, to do so, because, you know, the education boards were uh, contacting the local police and liaising with them to ensure that uh, parents were stopped and asked whether the children had um, satisfied the compulsory number of attendances, which were 200 per calendar year. So there was movement in the background to forcibly settle them and so that, you know, acculturation could take place there. Mm. And you mentioned that you grew up in one of these houses. Can you tell us about the the experience of that? What what the conditions were like for someone living think, there? Yeah, um, you know, it was fairly simplified housing. You know, if you look at the research conducted by Becky Taylor, there was really an old hut, the one I grew up in, uh, in Pitlochry at Bob and Mill, was a, a Nissen hut, which had been used for prisoners of war. Um, RAF walked around, or it was uh, then requisitioned uh, under Defence Regulation 56A by the Secretary of State. So, you know, we're seeing the control emanating from central government here. Mm. Um, and, you know, the conditions were very spartan. There was only cold running water, and over the years, um, the property fell into a state of dereliction and, you know, um, was condemned in 1962. But I think what is important here is the fact that my parents were still paying, you know, rent, rates, uh, council tax, poll tax, or, uh, uh, you know, over the, over the years they continued to um, be held responsible for, uh, you know, those substandard conditions and have to fork out money for those when in fact what happened was you know a, a grave violation of human rights over the years yeah. so yeah i mean you know the chimney pot broke at one point and it was only um an open fire in the center of the house you know and that meant that we had to feed logs coal you know, fuels to, to keep the heating going because there's no other form of heating. We had no electricity. Um, we had to study for school and degree examination by a uh, candlelight and tilly lamp. And if we ran out candles or paraf <laughs> or methylated spirits for the burner on the lamp, then we had, uh, you know, we were plunged into darkness. So we had no means of studying for deadlines, meeting deadlines which was yeah. very, very difficult, mentally tortuous. Yeah, so th these are these are conditions that you know, still too many people around the world live in today, and there are concerted efforts to try and eliminate those those conditions, but this is also something that happened in Scotland within living memory, within your memory. Well, that's right. I mean, I once travelled to Slovakia and, you know, I noticed the conditions in which Roma people were kept and, you know, there were obvious parallels. They had old huts with corrugated iron roofs, which, you know, just reminded me of our, um, you know, our, our backdrop in Scotland. <laughs> so it was like a home from home in a sense. <clears throat> um, you know, but you would expect that maybe more in, in Eastern Europe, you know, and, and given the, you know, the level of antipathy towards Roma people, but you, you know, it's something that you wouldn't expect to see on a normal mm. tour of the country at all of Scotland, is it? Mm. So what was the, the motivation behind this experiment? Now, the, the, you could interpret this as some kind of well-meaning but misguided colonial imperial attitude of the the white saviour as the trope goes, uh, trying to improve lives but doing it in a really cat-candied and ignorant way, or is this more malicious? Was this a deliberate attempt at ethnic cleansing or even genocide? Yeah, I think it's fair to say that it was certainly dressed up and couched in the terminology of care in the community, that it was put forward as a, a well-meaning approach to um, integrate the tinker into society. Now, 
you could find information about that in an article by Robin S. Creary in Scotland, which was published in 1958 on October the 11th. And he states that um, this was a very sore problem which would take one or two generations to eradicate in Scotland. So, in actual fact, as you say, it was more malevolent, you know, beneath the surface. Um, and it was really about removing a problem from Scottish society you know, a group who were deemed to be a social group, not an ethnic minority. Um, and that then would legitimise uh, intrusive state intervention to remove the problem. So it was about containment and control and re removal of a problem. So seeking yeah. seeking final solutions. It's there are certainly human rights implications right the way through this. And even to the modern day, I've, I've been looking up on this in preparation for, for this interview. And nomadic peoples, traveling peoples around the world don't seem to have an explicit right to a nomadic lifestyle in law. Uh, although universal human rights do protect cultural distinctions and practices, so implicitly that right is there. Um, why do you think we just that, that explicit right isn't there? Is it just a simple case of pe people not being a, being at the table when these rules are drafted? Well, I think you know the, the right to freedom of movement is enshrined in international legislation. You'll find it in you know a number of international legal instruments. So it is there, but it's not been applied. You know, the, the problem with human rights is that they are abstract concepts that are not actually applied in reality. You know, they exist in principle, but nobody ever acts upon them. And, you know, whether that's dictated by the political machinations in the background, nobody knows, you know, it's guesswork, really. But uh, I think, you know, there needs to be a move to embrace nomadic lifestyles, you know, whether it's Narkins, Roma, whoever, uh, and to possibly manage those in a way which is more beneficial for everybody and symbiotic. Yeah, I mean, as you say, these human rights they do need they do need applied and embraced, and uh, we have seen recently from the Scottish government uh, a push to integrate a lot of um, international treaties and UN level um, rights based principles into Scots law in an explicit way. Um, so there is maybe the hope that we could embrace something like this in Scotland if there is the will to do it. Um, what, is, what has been your engagement with the Scottish Government over the course of the, over, over your work? Well, to go back to your original point, uh, Craig, um, <clears throat> I think that these rights are enshrined in international uh, legislation and treaties and covenants that have been signed and ratified by the State Party. That's the first point I would wish to impress upon people. So there's a duty incumbent upon them to adhere to those and to uphold those rights, uh, which they've never really done in any, you know, form that I can see. Um, <clears throat> but uh, at the same time, research shows that there's, um, you know, there's a seismic gap in Scotland in terms of the protection mechanisms for, um, you know, for celebrating or, or, or upholding economic, social and cultural rights. And that's something which was seized upon by Professor Katie Boyle and the Dale Hughes, also from Roehampton University, in their paper identifying routes to remedy for violations of economic, social and cultural rights. Um, one of the things that they underscored was, um, you know, the absence of any uh, ESC rights in Scotland. And they said that the mechanisms were either insufficient or non-existent. So, you know, there's a lot of work to be done there if they wish yeah. to improve matters. Um, but my, uh, going to your second point, my engagement with the Scottish Government, uh, I had ongoing engagement over a couple of years as a member of a voluntary organisation and we uh, sent a delegation down to meet with firstly uh, Angela Constance and secondly um, Christina McKelvey in which 
you know, various members came along, survivors, and gave testimonies, personal testimonies of their experience and how the experiments had damaged their lives irreparably. Uh, and, you know, and they, they sought an apology. Uh, and we were given assurances that it would be taken seriously, but six months down the line, we still hadn't had any, you know, you know, any decent response, but eventually we did get, uh, you know, a couple of lines to the effect that the Scottish Government could not apologise on behalf of previous administrations or public bodies. So, you know, they were, in my view, seeking to disown the past mm. uh, and hadn't learned the necessary lessons. And at the same time, um, members of the community felt very slighted by this because they felt that it was disproportionate and that they had been excluded from, you know, the apology process. By the, also, yeah. uh, and also it's a, a fairly hypocritical stance because you point out in the paper where the Scottish Government has apologised for things that took place in yeah. another administration and pre-devolution. Well, that's correct. I mean... Quite rightly, the, the you know the Scottish government did issue apologies to a number of people. Um, you know, for instance, gay men who were uh, convicted of offences in the nineteen fifties and sixties, um, women who had received mesh implants, people who had been the recipients of contaminated blood. But there was also evidence of um, apologies being issued to uh, on behalf of public bodies such as NHS Highland by Jean Freeman. So, you know, these arguments are very weak and flawed and don't hold up to scrutiny, in my view. Yeah. And we've also seen other governments elsewhere um, issue apologies for previous administrations like Canada and its treatment of uh, the, the first peoples there. Again, right. a horrific episode of genocide and cultural extermination. And just this week, we saw Jacinda Ardern, uh, a right. great ally of, the, the, of, of Nicola Sturgeon, apologising for New Zealand's historic treatment of migrants going back to the 1950s, uh, apologising for, for things like Don raids and other oppressive tactics that Actually, the current UK government, the current Home Office, uh, considers normal normal practice. That's right. So you know, uh, you know, I, I, I wonder whether you know the government in Britain feels uh, whether it's due to bureaucratic hubris um, that it doesn't have to pay attention to what's happening elsewhere in the world. It's a very um, inward-looking approach. You know, I think they need to open their eyes and learn from other examples and other models uh, globally. And, you know, it would be, um, you know, it would be much to their benefit and also in their favour if they were to do so. And that does raise a bit of a question, um, and just to play devil's advocate on it, what would that apology, if it came, what would that actually mean given that this was a historic event that the current Scottish Government is not doing or, or uh, um, not planning to do in the future? Well, I think, you know, the current situation shows an absence of parity here, um, that we seem to be um, relegated down the pecking order and viewed as inconsequential in society. So it would, in a way enable um, an element of exalted status to be felt, you know, by the, the community who have suffered so much cultural trauma uh, as a consequence of the experiments. But, you know, I think it has to go beyond that. It has to be an effective apology, that there has to be, you know, a public acknowledgement of the impact this has had on people's lives and it moves to offer some form of redress uh, you know, whether that's compensation, restitution, where possible, and I don't think it is possible because people's lives have been, you know, irreparably damaged and uh, all their life chances and human rights have been obliterated in a nanosecond. But they could at least try to do something. Yeah. And, uh, and that raises questions as to why they haven't done so. Is this down to, you know, discrimination? Is it down to uh, ethnocentrism, the idea, the notion that we are somehow innately inferior and unworthy of an apology? 
So, you know, uh, people can interpret that as they see fit, but t- to me, uh, you know, it, there are a lot of questions that remain unanswered. And I don't think you can disown the practices of the past, you know, from the present day uh, for fear of replicating those. You know, I, if they don't learn where they've gone wrong in the past, how are they avoid making such pitfalls in the future? Yeah, and of course, even if this particular experiment is over, you know, the broader discrimination against gypsy, gypsy travellers and, and travelling people more generally um, in Scotland still remains. I certainly have experience in my own village of even elected local politicians stoking community tension against travellers you know, for their own political gain. So what else do we need from broader society here to, to, to help push push against that kind of attitude? Well, I would encourage, you know, anyone who's interested to look at the policies. And uh, for instance, you have the 1960 Caravans Act and, you know, there's provision within that act for farmers and, you know, forestry, people who uh, manage forestry to open up pieces of land and, you know, encourage gypsy travellers to reside there temporarily as part of a workforce. So I don't think that they're managing the options uh, effectively and that this is also curtailing people's possibilities, employment possibilities and life chances. But I'd also like to see um, a move away from uh, coercing people into signing a single Scottish single secure tenancy agreements which restrict travel off site for you know to seven weeks or something a year it used to be 12 but I think it's been cut further to seven weeks a year so these impinge upon the right to freedom of movement and um, yeah I think you know they're actually going down the wrong route here. They ought to be uh, embracing the culture and encouraging people to move and also, you know, opening up opportunities for them to contribute effectively to society rather than freezing them out of the employment arena. And, you know, and also freezing them out of public life because you don't see uh, any representation on public bodies uh, and quality bodies who, you know, remain silent throughout. Uh, I won't name names, but uh, one wonders whether they're, you know, uh, hiding out at base camp and out from Mongolia or something, because they're certainly not present and they're not uh, interacting with the community or taking any uh, lead role in trying to tackle the problem. You know, so... Sorry. That actually segues just into um, my, my kind of final question on this, and it goes beyond your, your paper. Um, Scotland has obviously been having a very intense constitutional question for the last several years around independence and the implications that will have uh, on the border between Scotland and England, over which I'm sure many gypsy travellers would like to continue having freedom of movement, no matter what state that border is in. We do have lessons around the world, like in the US, where there have have been, to varying degrees, oscillating over history, provisions in place for folk like American Indians who live across the border to be uh, between Canada and the US or the US and Mexico to be able to travel freely. Um, But these are quite specific provisions that have to be considered. Now, the SNP currently have a conference motion um, on on the book possibly to get discussed next month to form a border commission to discuss what shape the the, the Anglo-Scottish border would take upon independence. Is it vital that gypsy travellers are at the table when that discussion takes place? I think it is certainly highly recommended because, you know, it doesn't seem to matter whether we're at a table or not, uh, because there seems to be a selective um, hearing process there and uh, nobody seems to internalise what gypsy travellers are saying, and that's my experience of it. But at the same time, um, we should be, uh, you know, allowed to input into that. Um, I, I don't think that um, currently, as things stand, um, gypsy travellers enjoy freedom of movement across the border. Many are sedentarised in housing in Scotland, over 90% live in houses. So 
they're not uh, actually being afforded the opportunity to travel widely, and many haven't moved out with their own locale as a consequence. So what we're seeing is uh, people who are being corralled in sites uh, and usually against their wishes, I might add, um, and, you know, uh, precluded from enjoying, the, you know, everything that freedom of movement entails and uh, allows them, would allow them to do. So uh, uh, also there's the um, draconian policies like the policing bill in England and Wales, which are a deterrent to people from Scotland who might wish to travel across the border. But I think, yeah, there has to be some sort of special dispensation there for uh, gypsy travellers who wish to travel across the border down to England and Wales, um, but not at the expense of forfeiting their vehicles and, you know, possibly facing imprisonment and hefty fines. Yeah, it's... <laughs> Just a hard I'm just kind of thinking about all this and the implication that I have come come at this interview from a position of near total ignorance. Um, but it's certainly yeah, been fast when, learning, when I read your pa when I, <laughs> your paper was hard hitting. It was sobering, and it is an essential read. I will link to it in the description of this podcast. And I please everybody who listens to this, please read the paper. It is it's absolutely vital. Now, Seamus, can you tell us what the next step in the campaign is for you? Well, you know, as I hate to be the, you know, the killjoy and um, a bit like Ricky, what's his name? <laughs> the Reverend I am jolly, but I'm still struggling on a daily basis uh, with the legacy of the Met um, engendered by the uh, experiment. So, you know, I don't really have, I have, you know, I don't have professional employment. Um, I don't have savings. I don't have a decent home, which would satisfy a minimum tolerable standards. Um, I don't have any opportunities. I'm cut off in society, so can't enjoy participation in cultural life because, you know, we've been reviled and stigmatised and, um, you know, basically ghettoized as a consequence of the experiment. So you're seeing many of the 10 stages of genocide uh, coming into play here and acting against our interests. Um, so for me, it's about continuing to mount pressure on the government to realise, you know, uh, its past mistakes, whether that be the present administration or a previous one, uh, you know, it's there's a continuation on a theme here in terms of the thinking that underpinned the experiments, and I don't see any deviation away from that. Um, so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I, it's about, you know, keeping the pressure up, and hopefully I'll manage to throw in a bit of painting, but I broke my arm there the other week, so, you know, I'm, you know I kind of compromised in that respect at the moment. Um, as one of a number of graduates on site who have faced, you know, difficulties and feel that they're probably blacklisted, um, but have no proof of that, if we are more or less reduced to the old little bit of, you know, piecemeal uh, work doing stuff like acorn gathering. So, which is something I'd never envisaged for myself, you know, when I was a uh, going through the, the cloisters of academia in, in Aberdeen and Warwick and Alicante University. You know, it, it's not the sort of career option that I had in mind. But um, <laughs> you have to take what you can and make the best of it um, and, you know, and draw on the positives, if any. Um, I know that people here uh, who feel they ought to be in receipt of uh, benefits, disability benefits, have been denied repeatedly those benefits. Um, so things that are possibly owing to members of the Gypsy Traveller community have been, you know, they've been starved of those over the years. Uh, and it, it, the future, it shows, yeah, it's looking pretty bleak, actually. Yeah, just shows the corrosiveness that discrimination has and how it harms 
not just the people being discriminated against, but it's it's robbing everybody of the the spark that everybody can bring to the, our collective culture. Well, that's it. You know, uh, I think gypsy travellers can really enrich Scottish society. And, uh, you know, I'm actually someone who's in favour of independence myself. <laughs> you know, <laughs> as a Europhile, you know, I want to be able to travel to Europe. Yeah. But um, it's, you know, whether people are prepared to listen and, uh, you know, the power structure at the moment is coercive and in no way collaborative, so it doesn't include marginalised minorities and on that point even the um, you know the SNP mechanism for a nomination as a BAME or BAME or BAME candidate mm -hmm. uh, precludes gypsy travellers because they're not recognised as an ethnic minority for the purposes of recommendation as a BAME candidate. So, you yeah. know, there are all sorts of things there that need to be looked at and revised. Well, hopefully, hopefully, some of the folk, hopefully some of the folk listening to this podcast can get those conversations going and we can finally make some progress on this. Seamus, thank you so much for coming on to this podcast. You're this welcome. Has a, this has been a tough interview, but it's been an essential one and I really hope people will... Read your read your paper. Will send your paper to your 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 their representatives. Please get get in touch with your councillors and your MSPs and see if we can this end this this, yeah. this discrimination and and yeah. come to some reconciliation with ourselves and our own history. Thank so, you very much, then, Craig, for that. That's gone some way towards restoring my faith in human nature. Thank you and. I usually finish the podcast with uh, uh, a sign off, um, but given this uh, <laughs> this interview, it, it doesn't feel quite appropriate to do that. So I will just say to folk, please listen to this, share this podcast, and we'll be back next week.